Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Lady K Sailing. Today, we're talking about something pretty honest and something I think most of you would be pretty interested in is what cruising boat not to buy. And I know you guys know me as uh, being pretty real and pretty honest about things and I'm actually going to be comparing the cruising boat I bought and I've been using for cruising with the other options out there. And the perspective I'm going to take is uh, because I'm 38 years old, I figure most of the people that are about to do this thing are, are probably a little bit older than me, maybe a little bit less mobile, and maybe want a little more conveniences, and probably have a lot more money. So with all that assumed, um, we're going to go over like, there's a lot of people down south on boats like Lady K, older 80s um, sort of uh, racer cruisers and things like that. And then there's a lot of people down there on, I'm going to call them, and I'm going to group them together, and I'm going to say production boats. And that's your Beneteau, Jeannot, Hunter, Catalina, the newer sort of uh, white plastic production boats. And I'm not insulting them. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them. Um, actually, I would kind of prefer to have one of those. So let's get down to it. Okay, so um, I'm not going to talk about outfitting the boat. I'm just going to talk about the bones of the actual boat, not, you know, what solar panels to get and things like that. Um, we're just going to talk about what you're looking for in an actual boat and the bones of it. Um, and I sort of made a list of things that I have a problem with on this boat. And if I was less mobile or a little bit older um, and I wanted more convenience, um, these are the things that I think Lady K and a lot of the boats like this, these 80s racer cruiser kind of boats, that they really missed the point of. And they weren't designed to be cruising boats. This boat was not designed to be blue water and go to the Bahamas and, and go offshore and do all the things that I've been doing with it. Um, so I think that um, it's no fault of this boat that um, I have these problems with it. So here we go. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna talk about, and don't mind the socket set, this was just a really convenient place to put a socket set because you do wanna bring a socket set with you. Um, we're gonna talk about tankage which uh, this is Lady K's freshwater tank. It's her only freshwater tank. It's about 100 liters. So you'll have to do the conversion on that. Um, it is not very big. It, it maybe lasts for three or four days with two of us on board. Um, so it's not very much water. And the boat was just outfitted with this because she is a racer cruiser from the 80s. Um, it's enough to get through a weekend or a week with your family, which was the whole point of this boat, to be able to go places and have fun for a shorter period of time. So when you're looking at a cruising boat, tankage is a huge, huge deal. You want like 300 liters of water. You want a huge um, sort of black water tank or, or pump out tank that, that comes from the head if you don't go pop composting. Um, you want a huge fuel tank. You want a lot of, lot of tankage. And these older boats don't have that. So we actually had to sort of supplement this with the, the seven gallon blue jugs from Walmart that we ended up mounting under the bed. Um, which gave us actually this tank plus two more of this tank because we had six of those jugs. Um, so we were actually to get through, we were able to get through several weeks, like two, maybe two and a half, three weeks without having to deal with looking for water. Um, one of the things about cruising though is there's always going to be water available. Even in the out islands in the Bahamas, there's always a water spigot for some reason. You just have to go and haul it. So, I mean, a water maker sort of comes into play if you want to um, make sure and if you have the money and the space and the and the know-how put a water maker in because it's going to make all the difference but you still want a much bigger tank than this and a much bigger fuel tank lady k holds um i think it's 60 liters of diesel um it's about the same as, a, as your car um and that's not a ton i mean a few days of that and the tank will be empty so you have the jerry cans up on deck it is what it is right so tankage is number one Okay guys, the next thing you want, and this is a big one, a very, very solid, very reliable engine. Lady K was repowered before I bought her. So this is a Volvo MD2030. It's a three cylinder diesel, 27 horsepower, and it was new, um, relatively new, before I actually left the Great Lakes in the first place. It always ran like a, an absolute top. It still runs like a top, it fires right up. It runs for 14, 16 hours a day and it absolutely sips fuel. So I think you might say, well, it's a sailboat. Why do you need a good diesel? Well, the Erie Canal, the ICW, uh, days with no wind. 
um, days where it's absolutely storming and you're getting into trouble and you need to get out of trouble and into a harbor, this thing is going to save your butt so many times over. And a good one will have a good alternator and put lots of power into the battery. So um, absolutely, I wouldn't do it without an absolutely rock solid auxiliary engine other than the sails, a good diesel. Okay, the next thing I want to talk to you about is where you're going to sleep on this cruising boat. And this is one of the big problems with these older 80s racer cruiser kind of boats is the V-berth. And we'll take you up in Lady K's here. It is, I have it just set up uh, for guests, I guess. It's not bad for one adult, maybe two. Um, tried to sleep in here with two and it's not great. And when you wake up in the middle of the night, you bang your head. Um, so that part really sucks and if one of you has to get up to go pee in the middle of the night you're climbing over each other an old 80s v-berth is Not good and I knew that before I left. So what I did was I actually Made this SETI into a day bed So it's a queen-size mattress that's been cut and shaped around the mast and then shaped around the curves here But this side actually slides across and meets this side with some supports underneath so it actually becomes almost an entire queen-size bed you sleep sideways, midship, so when the boat's rocking and everything, it really minimizes the motion of the boat. If it's bucking up and down at anchor, you're sideways right over the keel. So it minimized that and had the TV right here on this little arm. So you could lay in bed and watch TV. It was quite nice. Um, the problem with it is if you're a little bit older than me, you're a little bit less mobile, and you're trying to get from the fore section to the aft section of the boat, and this is actually slid across and hooked up, you have to climb over the bed every time. And if somebody's sleeping in it, you know, it really sucks. Um, I slept on this side, so I had to climb over my significant other to get to the head if I had to pee in the middle of the night. So while this is a good solution for an 80s boat, and I would definitely, if you have a boat like this and you're looking for long-term sleeping, this is a really good way to do it. It works wonderfully. And this is a 12 inch memory foam um, mattress from Walmart. So it's so comfortable and it has the blue gel layer on the top. So it's actually pretty cool in hotter climates. So worked out really well, but if you're actually not mobile enough to deal with this you're going to want a boat like a little bit bigger production boat that has like the nice bed up in the v-berth or the nice bed in the aft cabin or both if you can swing that um, a lot of these 40 to 45 foot production boats tend to have a queen in the front a king in the back and they both have their own head with shower um, that's sort of the way i would go i think okay next up a fridge and freezer that actually works well this is lady k's fridge it's not huge and obviously the coal plate um, the evaporator has been taken out of it because it did fail um, it was installed in i think 83 and it failed in the bahamas and we luckily found somebody who could fix it with the parts to fix it but it failed again about a month later so we ended up buying this dometic fridge freezer and it's the the two thing freezer fridge and it's on right now that was nice and cool um it was sort of in a pinch uh we needed a fridge and freezer we're in the bahamas there's no more parts the original equipment is not going to cut it so I sacrificed the entire quarter berth to have that thing. So I think if you don't want to have to go through that nightmare, make sure that the boat has a legitimate good refrigeration system from the factory, not something that somebody sort of pieced together with a freezer from the factory or two freezers from the factory. That's really important, especially if you're going to be away from civilization for a long time. You want to be able to freeze a lot of meat and fish and things like that. Um, so solid, solid, solid refrigeration system. Absolutely. Okay, the next two we've got to go outside for, and it's blowing about 20 knots right now, so I apologize for any wind noise. Um, and my neighbors who don't tie their uh, halyards down. Um, I'm going to talk about the mainsail right now. Um, if you're a little less mobile than me, um, you're definitely going to want to be able to deal with the mainsail quickly, efficiently, and without any danger. You don't want to be up on deck wrestling a mainsail down and wrestling a sail cover on with bungee cords around it. So the stack pack, absolutely amazing. Um, this was actually one that we made, uh, Candace made this, and absolutely fantastic. What a great um, addition to this boat. If you can, do uh, an in-mast furling, of course, because that's even better, but if you don't have in-mast furling, 100% stock pack is the way to do it. And last and probably certainly not least, whoa, and last and certainly not least is the transom of your boat. Lady K, you have to climb over the stern rail and the ladder is just up there. And I think there's a lot of people that can't do it, can't get up and down that ladder, they can't get over the stern rail. Um, it just doesn't work. It's, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. 
Um, so a newer production boat, and I'm going to talk about those in a minute, with a sugar scoop or some sort of a walk-through transom onto some sort of a swim platform kind of thing, it will just it'll save your butt so much, especially when you're loading and unloading the dinghy with the groceries and everything. Um, and on that note, when you get that sugar scoop, dinghy davits, a million times over dinghy davits. I had to haul the dinghy and the outboard up onto deck with the spinnaker halyard every single time I went to sea. And it is a nightmare. And the wear and tear on the dinghy is not worth it. Pay a couple thousand dollars, have some davits put on or have them made, and it will save you so many thousands of dollars on replacing the dinghy constantly because it's scraping the lifelines and it's scraping the, the shrouds and everything like that. Dinghy davits a million times over. Absolutely, if the boat can support them, do it. All right, so maybe I've got you sold on buying a $100,000, $150,000 production boat. And I'll give you a few that are the most common and the ones that I really appreciated when I was sort of cruising around and meeting these people. Before we get there, maybe you're younger, maybe you have a 30, 40, 30 to 40 foot production or a, like old cruiser like this, and maybe you want to take it. I, no problem, it'll do it. I absolutely make sure it's solid, the rigging's good, the engine's good, everything I listed there, go and do it. But if you can afford to, and you're a little less mobile, um, and you need something a little more comfortable and a little more easy on the day to day, um, I think the production boat makes a lot of sense. It really does. And I'll tell you, like, the one I really, really want, and I've been on Oceanus 45s, Oceanus 50, um, regular Beneteau 50. I've been on the first series Benetos, um, a whole bunch of Catalinas and a whole bunch of hunters. Uh, I've sailed on these boats. I've been throughout the, the entire interior of the boats, met the owners, talked to the owners, been on a couple of big cats too. I'm not even going to go into cats because it's a whole different video. Um, I would say the one I want the most is sort of a tie between um, a Catalina 42 because that's sort of within my price range. You can pick one up for 100, 120,000 um, for a perfect one, uh, maybe 80 grand for one that needs some work. Um, so we're talking about like a six figure boat, but the Catalina 42 is so well laid out and it sails very well. Um, it's not a race boat, but it is fast, fast enough. And uh, it's so comfortable. Everything's so well thought out, you know, no space wasted, nothing like that. The other one I'm really interested in is gonna be a similar Beneteau in the 40 to 45 foot range. I'd really like a first because the first is the go fast version and I've been in them and I find you're not sacrificing very much comfort off of a normal Beneteau to get the Beneteau first. Um, so, I mean, that's something to think about. Uh, I, overall, I think if you can afford it, the best boat I saw down there of a mono hull is gonna be the Oceanus 45. Um, you are not gonna beat the Oceanus 45. It's twin helm, it's got the fold down transom, like it's just everything and you walk inside and it's like, a cathedral it's so big uh, you can run around in it the Oceanus 45 particularly Ungava um, we were on that boat quite a bit and what an amazing boat so much space and it sails so incredibly well you can have 15 people in the cockpit for, for a cocktail hour no problem the boat doesn't even bat an eye at it um, so uh, the other ones are there were a couple of hunters uh, here and there um, not so much. I know there's a lot of uh, cons or, uh, uh, sort of uh, arguments about Hunter and a lot of people don't like them. Um, I've, I've never really had a problem with Hunter. Maybe they're a little bit cheaper than the Catalinas and the Benetos and the Genos. Um, but um, there were a couple Hunters down there, but largely it was Catalinas, Catalina 42, I mean five or six of those at all times. Um, a couple Oceanus 45s, a couple Beneteau 40, 41, 43. Um, those are just, I think if you're gonna do it and you have the six figure 120 130,000 to spend on something you're looking at 40 to 45 foot Benetos and Catalinas and maybe Genos if you see a Genoa because that's a Beneteau anyway um, but yeah Catalina Beneteau a thousand times over I think uh, if I ever have the money and I'm done with Lady K it's probably going to be like a Beneteau first 40 to 45 area amazing absolutely amazing boats and one of the things, if you're thinking about taking one of these old boats, and I'm just gonna talk about Lady K specifically, is Lady K is an IOR design, which means she was designed around a set of rules um, back in the late 60s, early 70s, up to the 80s. She was designed around the set of rules where they 
couldn't do certain things and they, they changed the shape of the boat to sort of get around the rules. So Lady K has tumble home, which is very, very fat in the middle and it's rounded. So it always hits the dock, which is kind of annoying. I find it very pretty when you look at the back of one of these tumble home IOR boats, it, it starts really small and then it almost looks like it's pregnant. It's this huge middle section. And I think it's a very pretty sailboat and I think they sail very nice. And I do have an appreciation for IOR, but IOR on a cruising sort of a lifestyle is very very slow they were designed to run at full heel and that's where they are fastest and most comfortable and in your cruising life you'll almost never have the perfect beam reach or anything like that so really the design of the boat doesn't work for what you're using it for and that was the problem with lady k if you're going down the icw or the erie canal and you're motoring with the mast down or something you're never going to have any heel and thus you lose uh in this boat's case it's several feet of the water line i think it's actually seven feet this boat loses a water line when she's sitting straight up. So your motoring and your hull speed is five and a quarter knots. When the when the rail's down, sure, it's seven knots, but the rail's never down. Um, you know, unless it's a perfect day in the perfect conditions and you're not on the ICW and you're not in the Erie Canal. Um, and that's large a large part of cruising is getting through these, you know, hard to get through canals and ditches and stuff. So an IOR boat really makes no sense whatsoever. They're very good at racing. They're very happy with 20 to 25 knots, um, but they're not very good at cruising and they tend to be small. Um, and tight inside. Lady K's got, you know, standing headroom and she's okay inside, but these production boats, they're faster flat out when they're, when they're straight up and down. They're a lot faster. They don't, they have, a lot of them have plumb bows, so they don't lose their water line. Um, they're going to be faster almost 99% of the time. So it just makes more sense. They're going to be more comfortable too and better on fuel. So, I mean, there's all that. All right. I hope this video helped you guys. If you liked the video, please give me a thumbs up. And if you want to see the next video, hit that subscribe button. And thank you to all the Patreons that make all these videos possible and help me build up the Cruising Kitty to head for the North Channel. I'll see you guys next week.